This show is sponsored by Den 10 Insurance Services, helping businesses get the right insurance for all their insurance needs. Visit den10.io to get a quote. D E N T E N.io. And remember, when you buy an insurance policy from Den 10, you're giving back on a global scale. Hello, all my entrepreneurs and business leaders, and welcome to the Michael Esposito Show, where I interview titans of industry in order to inform, educate, and inspire you to be great. My guest today will change your life. She has overcome unthinkable circumstances, all while building her own strength and courage to carry on. She comes from a long line of entrepreneurs and today helps business leaders and entrepreneurs achieve their wildest dreams through one-to-one coaching, group coaching, and other programs in her coaching business, Master of One Coaching. She's my business coach and friend. Please welcome Merit Minemeyer. Hello, what an introduction, my goodness. Welcome, Merit. <laughs> Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you on the show. This has been a long time coming. Um, as you can imagine, as I told you already in the pre-show, that I've brought you up a lot during this show, <laughs> <laughs> during multiple episodes. So for our listeners, if you go back to uh, my second episode, A Trivium Point, Merit minimeyer has got her stamp all over that oh episode. Oh my goodness, my um, goodness. I just also had one with uh, Heather Howley that I mentioned to you earlier, mm-hmm. and she was talking about her business coach, and I couldn't wait to bring up Merit. <laughs> and a lot of that is because in my opening there, it's so true, especially for me, in that by meeting you over the course of the past, I don't know, five or six years that we've known each other, mm-hmm. um, getting to know you on a personal level and then and then engaging with you as coach and I guess mentee, I guess is mm-hmm. what I am, right? <laughs> um, and student, uh, I've actually been able to accomplish things that I thought were dreams, mm-hmm. that I thought, you know, cool, you know, I want a podcast one day. You know, I want to own a business one day and, um, you know, that'll happen, but never really having a true plan or a true vision for what it looks like and yeah. to see it happen. And I, I remember this moment <laughs> vividly, and I've, I know I've told it to you before, we were at a ribbon cutting at One Epic Place in New Paltz, mm-hmm. and I was telling you, yeah, I want to have a podcast. And you said, so what's stopping you? And I was like, well, you know, I'm working through some things. I was giving you a whole bunch of excuses. And you said, so what's stopping you? I don't know if that's exactly <laughs> what you said every time, but that's what plays in my mind. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know, I'm working through the technology and this recorder that I'm working with. And you said, so what's stopping you? <laughs> and uh, although you didn't say it exactly like that to me, you you led me to start the process of what it could be. And from there, I was able to start the Shining Light podcast, which I had you on as one of my first guests, mm-hmm. which we got to go through your journey. And so today, what I'd like for our listeners to hear is your journey, your journey through the world of merit. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but you do. You have a it's wonderful- It's a colorful world, the world of merit. <laughs> it is a colorful world, and there's a lot of things that you and I share in common. So I, I would love for you to start um, wherever you'd like to start from, but you do come from a long line of entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and going all the way back to your great granddaddy. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> it's true. Well, so yeah, and so my great grandfather on my mother's side uh, was um, a tent revival preacher. Wow. Where I think I actually got the performance genes from. Right. Um, and I cannot speak one way or another on the uh, authenticity of his practices. I don't know. I've only heard some stories. Uh, but uh, at any rate, my grandfather grew up as a kind of a, a genius um, prodigy kid. And, and so people would go come to my great-grandfather's tent revival events in the Midwest. And um, my grandfather at the age of like 10 or, you know, little kid, would they would shout out Bible verses to him and he'd be able to recall them. Sight on, I mean, he just he had them all in his head. And so he was kind of this little prodigy performer, preacher kid. Uh, and that's the, the grandfather that grew up to be, um, you said, titan of industry before. And he was definitely one of those. He was a self-made um, multimillionaire. He created many bu- businesses. He had some incredible experiences. He started up on the, on the line, the assembly line of creating um, aircraft during the war. And actually, I had t- told a story once about having lunch with Howard Hughes <laughs> in that um, 
in that industry and then worked his way up basically to owning that company and then selling it and then buying other companies and then selling them and then coming and being a fixer for a while. And eventually started his own company, Stevens International, which was a publicly traded company. Uh, and in the 80s, I believe that's when that happened. And I remember getting stock certificates in my Christmas stocking. That was a thing. And um, we traveled all over the world going to trade shows, print shows. So he, the, the company was um, building and and delivering and maintaining printing and currency presses. So we actually made money. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and we had our presses in the Bank of England, and um, there was some discussion of Russia. I'm not really sure what happened there, but that was in the 80s and 90s. So I had there's a lot of imagination that can go into that. Um, and a few other you know, government banks, the U.S. Actually, we had a, a press or two with the U.S. government. And we also did things like cereal boxes. And I say we. I mean, the company did that. I was, I was the one peripherally involved. But I did go to board meetings regularly as a little kid. And I would run around the office, and you know, my grandfather and my uncle were the were the CEO and founder and president, and um, so I was, I was absorbing it through osmosis from a very young age. My whole family and that side of the family was involved in the business, uh, in some way, and my cousins still run it today, and and it's it's more of a service business now, but um, it's changed size and scope significantly. But that's what I that's that was one side of my upbringing. I really got that DNA coding from a very young age. And then my other side, um, my father's side, my grandfather owned a nursery, and so it was a small business owner, and they lived on a a small farm in Indiana, and uh, my father became an architect, and so my parents actually ran a small design and build firm on the main street of my town, my hometown in Carmel, California, Ocean Avenue, shout out to Carmel, where Clint Eastwood was mayor, and... um, and so I also, I joke that I grew up in a sawdust pile instead of a sandbox <laughs> because I was always on the job sites. Like, and I loved it. I loved being on the job site. I love that smell of sawdust. Still gets, like, it's like my favorite smell in the world. Like the, the, it really brings out the experience, the memories of new right. and exciting and creativity and um, what's coming next. Um, yeah. You know, so yeah, those smells, especially like the ones from chi- well, definitely the ones from childhood. They just bring you right back. It's yeah. it's amazing how how smells do that. Uh, those senses, right? Yeah. yeah. I I want to stay on. I believe it's your great grandfather, the printing press, right? My grandfather. Grandfather. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I want to go to him for a second because uh, part of our uh, coaching group, yeah. you had brought him up mm-hmm. and, and you had brought up something that I think is really important for entrepreneurs <laughs> and, and business leaders to hear, um, especially since a word today uh, is somewhat overused, but is really important, the word pivot mm-hmm. and, and knowing when to pivot and understanding why you should pivot. Mm-hmm. And so let's go back to your grandfather and his printing press and he's literally printing money, Mm -hmm. and he's a publicly traded company, Mm -hmm. and he is crushing it Mm -hmm. in the 90s, Mm -hmm. and then... Yeah, so I <laughs> so I tell this story because I, I have my own version of it from my perspective, sure. right? And, and I was not in the business altogether. Right. Um, like I said, my uncle, my mom, my cousins, my they were all in... And there's a lot of people who worked with the company. So my observation of what happened, and based on what I saw what I glean from the stories and just kind of what I um, have, have synthesized over the years is, is they, um, they decided not to take certain roads that could have led them to a whole new set of opportunities. Mm-hmm. And what they decided to do, my grandfather really decided to do instead of that was to double down on the industry where they were thriving in the moment. Mm-hmm. And, um, I want to. Sometimes I, I can be when I'm telling the story. I can get a little flippant because it's you know it's, it's I can it's a uh, I want to be careful is what I'm saying because sure. I, I don't want to dishonor what they did or right. And I wasn't there in the rooms making the decisions, but I do. What I what I recognize is that there they could have gone through, you know, diving in through desktop publishing, right? Or when debit cards became a thing, it was sort of. Um, seen as like, oh, well, we're not really sure if this is a fad or if this is something that's just a trendy thing that's going to phase out. And I found myself using debit cards instead of cash. Right. I'm like, oh, oops. Right. Like, you know, I was, am, I, am I biting the hand that feeds me right. here, right? Um, so, and so my grandfather, you know, he uh, 
doing his level best to to save and support the people who who worked for him. He put all a ton of his own personal resources into the business and ultimately um, didn't work out so well. He, he put a ton of resources into the business to keep it the same. Correct. Rather than change. That's correct. Right. That's correct. To change with the times. Yeah. Um, I bring this up not to um, not to take away from any of the amazing things that your grandfather did, but in our coaching, um, I, I felt like there was a lesson in here for for me, for all for anybody who's listening. Um, obviously, the, the the there's a lesson here about pivoting and everything. Yeah. But then we also um, in all the books that I've read and everything, when companies get so big, they lose that flexibility. Yeah. And and so when when you were telling the story in our group, I was listening to it and I was thinking about that. How you had said publicly traded company, and today you talked multi millionaire. So obviously there, there's a lot of money and there's so much invested in things. And so it's really hard to just change course. Yeah. And well, go ahead. Well, what I, what I want to ask you about <laughs> that is because you know we talk about energy leadership. That's that's what you mm-hmm. teach. Um, that's what you train. Um, but you also are very open minded to all sorts of other things. I don't want to just limit to to that. Um, I I was wondering how would you have approached this situation as as your grandfather's coach? Yeah, and I think about that all the time, and, and it's a lot of what actually what drives me in my work today. Not just my grandfather, but also my father, uh, and in the business that he and my mother built, and then ultimately sort of crumbled with him. Mm. Um, so the reason that I, a lot of the reason that I do what I do, and also seeing going through my career of 20 plus years in nonprofits and seeing this over and over again too, this founders, that's this idea of founder syndrome, which mm-hmm. is basically it's the business that is predicated and, and focused on the personality of the founder and which can be an amazing thing. The founder is you know, dynamic and engaging and inspiring and people, right? We need the leaders of these organizations to be those things, charismatic so that we believe in what they do. And we want to follow them uh, in a way that is, dedicated and loyal, but not blind. Mm -hmm. And founders can too become blind to their own charisma Mm. and their own belief system. And we become, um, we buy into our own BS, (laughs) 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 you know, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, So if we don't surround ourselves, when we put ourselves in an echo chamber of people who are just saying, yes, you're awesome, yes, you're awesome, yes, you're awesome. And we don't have people on our team going, ah, wait a minute, hang on. You know who are who are providing those counterpoints mm-hmm. to what we think is right. Um, it becomes very dangerous because we close ourselves off to other possibilities. Right, and it's a fine line of of following your gut and really trusting your intuition, mm. and also going, okay, where is my ego getting in the way, or where is my fear getting in the way, mm. and who on my team do I really, and team can be the people who you employ. It can also be people like a coach or a mentor or a board or whatever, mm-hmm. um, or thought partners, you know, they're outside of your organization. Other people who are in a similar position saying, hey, you know, you might want to think about this because right. even though you, you might believe that you're right here, what else could be true? Right. You know, I like what else could be true. And I think we see that with a lot of different leaders uh, where they, they don't have the person yes. kind of checking in with them. Uh-huh. And and I think that it's it's really important. I don't know uh, what the solution is for every founder. For me, obviously, it's, it's hiring somebody like you to where it helps me, one, see the vision. I talk so much about that, about seeing the vision and then taking action on the vision. But I think on the other side of that, we haven't gotten there yet, thankfully. Um, but is if I was going down a road where maybe you saw, hey, Michael, maybe you want to ask some questions here. Mm-hmm. And actually, we, we do talk about that sometimes about certain things. Yeah. We, we do bring that up. So You also mentioned the other day about somebody on your team who called you out on something where you said, hey, I, I really want this thing to be this part of my culture and my organization. Oh, right. Integrity. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Integrity. And and uh, I know, and I don't want to divulge too much of the details, but you had someone on your team say, hey, wait a minute, Michael, you talk about integrity. Like, this is really in our integrity. You went, oh, right. <laughs> Right, and that's but that's the beauty of a really sound culture. Right, is like you're actually your team is empowered to call you out, just like you need to call them. Right, so it, there's a, um, it you are in a matrix of of mm-hmm. true culture as opposed to just being an echo chamber of the the, the charisma that is you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I kind of want to go to culture for a second because. Um, when I think about my company uh, and and any company, I start to wonder. 
and, and this is this is going to sound strange because I I value you so much, but then I start to wonder where is the need for the coach and all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And when when can you start? Um, being able to kind of be self-sustainable to where, mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm answering my own question, to where I guess the culture kind of helps that checks and balances that you need? Yeah. So it's a great question. And, and of course, the goal, my, my goal is always to, to work myself out of a job, uh, ultimately, or at least to the point where any client is, is self-sufficient and confident enough where I don't need to, uh, we don't need to be in conversation all the time. Mm. It, that that the client is uh, developed um, their own skills enough. Excuse me, <clears throat> develop their own skills enough where they feel that they can handle what comes at them. And also, growth is dynamic, and change is dynamic. And sometimes things come through or come across our desk that are like, "Wait a minute, that's something that I considered before." Okay, I need to put that into my cauldron of of stuff that I deal with and I'm not sure this new ingredient is something I don't know, really know how to handle. So, so it's a, um, it's a beautiful thing for my position to be able to say, all right, you know, amazing, awesome CEO and founder client, go and do your thing and fly. And if you ever need to touch base with me, come back. I'm always here, mm. you know? Uh, so I don't, I don't ever cut myself unless I shouldn't say ever. There are very few occasions when I've cut myself off from a, right. a relationship, coaching relationship, uh, because most of the time, I want to be a resource for as much as I can, as long as I can. Yeah. So a good place for a business to end up is to where they build a culture that can support the vision, yeah. the CEO's vision, mm -hmm. and and be able to kind of take off from there and then always have someone like you in the wings to uh, to solve some, some problems for them. I'll say one more thing about that, which is that uh, part of this paradigm shift of emphasis on culture where it has not been for so long is we're seeing more and more companies who are having monthly check-in meetings about their culture. Mm. So again, that can be a little bit of an echo chamber if we're not careful, but, and uh, who on the team is accountable for what elements of the culture and, and, and how confident are they? Um, how, how much are they listened to is important to check in on too. Like, well, you know, uh, this element of the culture where we talk about you know, attending to the whole person Oh yeah, we're doing a really good job of that. You know, in in the meantime, there might be somebody in the wings going. Mm, you know, actually, I feel like I'm not attended to. So we need to make sure there's integrity and conversation about that. And but having those monthly or you know weekly court whatever it is quarterly meetings about like okay, as an organization, how are we doing internally, um, is a relatively new phenomenon, which I encourage. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's very tricky. I'm learning that very quickly. Um, there there are things come up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll be vague for for purpose for obvious purposes, but things come up, and you think that you're leading a culture a certain way, but everybody's got their own personality, and everybody has their own old baggage. I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas like I I always I've talked with you about this before, where I would like each one of my employees to have a coach like you assigned to them <laughs> to help them, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because. It's great that, you know, I get on a call twice a week with all of them and am positive and bring in a great amount of energy to them. And we have a text chain where, you know, I try to same thing. Good morning, everyone, and be positive or anything. But then all the hours outside of that, they get to be themselves again mm -hmm. and they get to fall into whatever habits or mentalities or energies, as we talk about in our mm -hmm. coaching, mm -hmm. that they kind of live in. Yep. And without, I think, that one-to-one -one coaching I think it's really hard to change that. And and it's not even the one-to-one -one coaching. It's it's really they have to want that one-to-one -one coaching. Well, 100 percent. I mean, change only happens when the person who's changing right. is bought into the, the, the change. And even then, it's hard. To it's have. hard, yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a show called Billions, which I have another client who refers to me as is Wendy Rose, who is the <laughs> – and I don't wear – for those out there who watch Billions who do not wear stilettos or engage in some of the other behaviors that coach does. But uh, – <laughs> but the, the, the reason he calls me that is because – um, you know, we're talking about me bringing, coming into his company culture and working with some other okay. of the, the people in his, you know, the higher ups in his firm so that there is uh, alignment around the culture and they're creating a, a, a common language around mm. um, how they interrelate and how they communicate with each other and mm. how they uh, perceive each other and themselves, right? So there's a, um, a whole, a whole buy-in across the firm of of personal and professional development, and um, there's unity on that, you know. Uh, personal and professional development. 
I'm, I'm going to be like the Larry King here of os- asking the obvious answer <laughs> question, sure. but it's really to lead to, to obviously you elaborating on it, which is um, when you look at personal development, you look at professional development, it can be on paper an expense to an organization. Yes. Mm-hmm. How profitable do you see that being to an organization versus being an expense? Well, there's a statistic out there. I think it was from Forbes, but I could be misquoting it. So I can I can put a link to it in the show later if you want. Um, but there was something to the effect of there's a study done by a, a Fortune 500 company, and they invested in executive and leadership coaching, which is a, a, the, the umbrella that I fall under um, is executive and leadership coaching in their business. And it was something like 775% return. I mean, it was some ridiculous number. It was like mm. so crazy. Um because it it's not about just the individual. It is about um, and, and them creating their own goals or, or setting or achieving their own goals. It is about retention. It is about um, keeping people accountable uh, to themselves and to other people. It is about creating teams that are uh, unified and, and working and as well oiled machines. Um, and it's about people coming to work and wanting to be there. Mm. And if there is a culture that starts with the leadership, right, it has to start with the leadership, uh, that is thriving, then people are going to flock to that Mm -hmm. organization. Over the last year or so, we've seen, um, you know, the great resignation that happened last fall, and now it's like the great reshuffling, I think is what they're referring to it. Really? (laughs) Yeah, it's so interesting. Uh, because people were calling into question during, you know, lockdown times and COVID, they were saying not just, oh, I don't want to go back to work, but I don't want to do work that is killing my soul. Like that was really the questions that they were asking themselves were about their own priorities as human beings. And, you know, why would I want to go to a job that doesn't value me as a person? And so they're actually not just looking at the work they're doing or the company they're working for. They're looking at the priorities in their whole life. You know, maybe I don't need the four-bedroom house and two and a half cars or whatever. Uh, maybe I need a two-bedroom house and a van that I can go take live in with my kids and on the during the summers and live the van life. And we saw a lot of that. I mean, actually, my husband and I joked about that at one point, and we looked into getting an RV, and we couldn't find one. Right. <laughs> Because <laughs> they are so popular. So there's a whole cultural shift uh, happening around work. And so the investment in a leadership and executive coaching um, process is really about creating work that is meaningful for people. Mm. And they want to do. And, and being, a, being the leader, being a person in that organization, that people want to work with. Right. Because we're making different decisions now. It's not about uh, leaving your stuff at the door or business isn't – it's not personal. It's just business. Like that's right. an old paradigm that is – is we're leaving behind. Mm-hmm. And people are just not willing to put up with it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just making different choices. So um, – I think it's very personal. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, personal. it's tied to your well-being. It's very personal. Yeah, I mean, it's tied to your, your income, like your, the way you take care of your family. How could it not be personal? Right. You're there so much, too. You yeah, do, of do so much, so many hours. Yeah. Uh, I think the obvious question is about building culture virtually. Mm-hmm. It's tough. It is tough. And actually, I have a, a great friend, Sarah Emhoff, who is a leadership coach as well, and she actually built a whole business during covid around creating virtual culture, and mm. uh, it, which was really, really smart. And now she's doing it in person, too. They're called, she developed this pro- program called Huddles, where it's like a 90-minute a, a session where people just play and get creative. And um, there's been such a hesitancy in sometimes, especially working with big corporations, to play because they think, oh, this is work. It's not play. And we get very, like, you know, tied up in a knot about it. So she's – one of the things she's doing is helping people relate to each other on a human level mm. and, and try to – expand the way we identify at work beyond I'm at my desk, I do my thing, I build the widget, I create the document, whatever. But no, I'm a whole person coming to work, even virtually. And I have kids in the background, and, you know, you'll see my cat <laughs> all the time walking across my desk when you and I are meeting. Um, yes. That's, <laughs> you're like, yes, I do. But so the, the boundaries have really blurred mm. in the, the last two years. And some of that's been kind of a pain. And some of it's been wonderful. Yeah. 
I, I agree with that. Um, I, I was thinking while while we're while you were mentioning about the the huddles there was when you and I talk about um, life balance mm-hmm. or harmony, mm-hmm. and I thought that that's a really good thing to bring up about how big corporations look at it as like you're here to work and then play is separate. Yeah. And I think we're all so conditioned or have been so conditioned in that I work my eight hours or I work whatever my shift is and that's work mm-hmm. and then I can play after. Right. But I find um, that when you have that mentality, you don't really play after from the the people that I've been in contact with that have those kinds of shifts and those mm-hmm. lives that where it's like they have a very specific job and they go there to do that job. And then when they come home, it's like takes them forever to unwind mm-hmm. from that job. Yeah. And I think it's really hard to let it go versus um, I, I know that I'm not perfect in any way, but my life kind of like intermingles with my my business, my work life. And I feel like, I mean, I know that Devin would probably be like, she, she would have a completely opposite opinion on this. <laughs> I know that, that, but from my perception, right, yeah. is that like it's easy for me to sit on the floor, play with the girls, and then get on my phone and do an email. Now, it's not healthy either to do that all the time, but what I'm trying to get at is more of like that, that harmony of being able to, like for instance, today, Denise was home with me this morning. I'm able to do work. I'm able to go check in on her. I'm able to kind of like talk with her like a human, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. Not like a robot that's at work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm able to come here, you know, drop her off, come here and know that I'm going to pick her up later right after here to then do more work with, while she's present yeah. um, or go to ballet with them. And while they're in there doing their thing, I'm emailing and you, you, yeah. you follow where I'm going with that? But to, absolutely. And well, and that's that's part of the beauty of being an entrepreneur, right? I mean, that's one of the reasons that people do what you're doing and what I what I do is because we want to get out of that feeling of I have to be one person at one place and then I'm another person in another place. Right. This bifurcation of personality, uh, which is just not human. And I think that ultimately what that does is puts us into the, the sort of fight or flight mode because it's like a, such a stressor. Like how do I, how do I um, code switch? And how can I be this one person here? And But I can't really – I might have a picture of my kid on my desk or I might not, you know, depending on how I want to be perceived. Mm. Um, or at home, you know, my, my life is very different. It might be a mess or it might be whatever. I mean, I mean in terms of like the environment, right? We have this very sterile environment of like work and life and – and cubby and like, you know, my pen cup. And then we go home and like my laundry's over the floor. It's just, it's a very, it's not, there's, to have that kind of disjointed existence is very confusing and very difficult to maintain uh, from an energetic and from a personality standpoint, you know. Mm. It's just, a, there's a lot of code switching that has to happen there. If we're not, don't have that congruence. Uh, yeah, and you and I worked on that too, because I, I remember that of like feeling, um, I think the other thing that we're touching on is imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm is that imposter syndrome. I mean, that was something you had to work on with me. And and I think, I don't know if if, uh, if it ever goes away, um, but I think that you start learning different things about yeah. yourself mm-hmm. that help it go away mm-hmm. or help you understand like, hey, you know what? You, you deserve to be in this room. It's okay. But I think going back to what you're talking about, um, this harmony, this life balance is probably sometimes what leads to some of that imposter syndrome because you're living one way Absolutely. at work Absolutely. and you're living a different way at home and you're like, well, I don't deserve the promotion or I don't deserve to be interviewing this awesome guest. And and it's right. because you're living a different way at home. But when you level up at home and leveling up at work just becomes the same thing, right? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. My perspective on this is specific about performance. I use the word performance a lot. When I uh, was coming up, as a little kid, I was uh, identified as a performer, and so that became who I was. I was a performer, and I was accused several years ago. Uh, I was talking to a, a very dear friend of mine who was saying, you know, I said, I just don't know. I'm feeling like I have to put on this show for people, and then I come home and I fall apart. And he said, well, stop performing. And I was like, I, I literally did not know what he meant. <laughs> Because I was so accustomed to that thing of everything's great, everything's fine, I'm awesome, I'm strong, I'm fantastic, I'm everything's gonna be great, I'm you know, and putting on this front and then going home and feeling like a shell of a person. Mm. And I was really offended when he said that because I was like, what do you mean about not being honest? And I'm not, and he didn't mean it to be offensive. What he meant was stop putting yourself through this. 
right. this ringer right. of performance. And it really shook me because I was 35 when he said this or 36. So I spent my whole life performing, keeping up a facade and not doing it because I was trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes, but just because I was – you know, in an environment, in a culture, which was very, uh, put, a, put a lot of value on high performance. And also I was a performer, like, like literally, Theater. <laughs> like I was literally a performer. So, yes. so I had, I had, uh, what's this word? <laughs> the word that I'm using, I'm making an image with my hands about like overlaying or intermingling, in, in, yeah, or... Interming, integrated with that, the sense of these performance skills as necessary part of living. Mm. And I think we all do that, or many of us do that to an extent, mm. um, which leads to imposter syndrome because it is a feeling of there's part of me that isn't here. Right. And it's interesting. If they, or, sorry, if they, yeah. if they only knew what was happening, if I only knew that my laundry was on the floor, if they only knew that my kids were screaming this morning, if they only knew that uh, I, I'm driving a car that I'm not proud of, or they only knew that I only had X amount of dollars in the bank account, right? Right. Uh, but I have to pretend that that's not true. Right. As opposed to saying, hey, you know what? I'm a mess and I'm still here and it's cool. <laughs> yeah, and how and how uh, freeing it is mm-hmm. to be able to do that. And then once you shed that, then it's like, it's done. Yeah. Like you don't need to do it again. It's so scary to do it, but once you do it, it's like, oh my gosh. So there's a few things uh, there. One is we go back to how you have that person that, that you were able to check in with that mm-hmm. wasn't the, the yes ma'am, yes merit. Everything's yeah. wonderful, for, yes merit. For sure he was. Not Maybe not right. always welcome, but definitely he was. Yeah. Maybe not, yeah. <laughs> and, and there's different ways of doing that. And, and I think that that's part of your coaching program at the Energy Leadership is there's different ways of approaching. And I think mm-hmm. that sometimes, I, I watch this show uh, on F1 Racing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's a great show for me because one, I love cars, but it it's, it, it, it has that leadership piece to it of like you have these these you talk about performers right you have these great athletes out on the on the, on the track mm-hmm. and then you have their coaches who are watching this who also have to like check in with these guys whose egos are just through the roof <laughs> and I was watching an episode last night and it was like a closed door situation but you know the mics are always on right. <laughs> always a hot mic um, and uh, and the way that the coach was approaching uh, his driver was interesting because I was thinking hmm I don't think Merritt would have I think Merritt it would have had some suggestions for him is mm. what I was thinking. And it was because we talk about collaborating mm-hmm. a lot and, and coaching and like that being one of the highest levels. And it was, uh, you have this, this ego, right? This, this driver who they have to have a tremendous ego. Of course they could check it and all that, but they got to, right? Mm-hmm. They, they got to think they're the best because if they don't, they're going to die. Yeah. Right. 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 And then you have a coach who's telling them like, Hey, you can't speak to us like that. Now, I know from our coaching is that that's probably not the best approach. It depends on the moment too. Right. right? It depends on the moment. Like, well, there was moment. There was time. Yeah, there was right. time between the, tr- the course and meetings. It, w- it was like, let me speak to you outside of this meeting. Yeah. And they pulled right. them aside. So there was time to maybe come in and say, what do you need? Mm-hmm. How can we how can we make this a better situation? How can we talk about things like collaborate, right? Which mm-hmm. is which is what we talk a lot about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so having that person to check in and maybe help you see some of that. Um, you bring up your story mm-hmm. and I think your story is so important to share. Uh, one, you, you also speak about it a lot. It's on your website, yeah. uh, you know, so you can go to Mer- master of one coaching.com and you could learn more about merit there. <laughs> but, um, I remember when I first interviewed you on the shining light and you shared this story, I had no idea about any of this. Oh, really? I had no idea. Oh I, gosh. I didn't that was know. the first time you that heard was that? The first time I heard it. <laughs> and, um, and I was like blown away by it. And part of why I think it's so important for our audience to hear as entrepreneurs, business leaders, wherever they are in their, in their journey, is that we can all overcome tremendous challenges. And you're not alone. And like what you just said there about being 35 years old and realizing you need to change, you're never too young or too old to change. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing that has happened in your life that hasn't happened to somebody else's that has changed. Yeah, right. And so... Let's go back to performer okay. merit, <laughs> and uh, and I know that you were a performer in the theater, and mm-hmm. maybe it was during those days. But tell us about that performance that you had, and then going into that journey of of fostering children and adopting them, and and then raising them, and that journey that you went through there, and then discovering yourself in all of that. Yeah. So uh, yes. Okay. So I'll start just briefly. I mentioned the performing piece. I did start performing when I was about three. Uh, and doing dance, and then that slowly turned into acting and singing, and um, and I became 
valued and known for that. That was the thing that I did, right? We all have our kind of identities that we put on in school, and that was that was mine. I was a class clown. There so. you go. <laughs> <laughs> as, you could, as all of you can imagine. <laughs> and I followed that into college. So I went from, grew up in Carmel, California, moved to New York City to pursue my bachelor's of fine arts in acting, which I completed in three years. People go, oh my, say about that. Oh my goodness, you, you must have been so amazing and so brilliant. And I was like, no, I just wanted to get the heck out of there. because At I was like, NYU. At NYU. Uh, I just was so driven to go and do something in the world. And, um, and I had a lot of, I was very reactive. I was a very, very reactive young adult mm. and adult, I mean, uh, adolescent and young adult. And so I was just running, 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 running. <laughs> as fast as I could. Graduated when I was 20 years old and wow. thought I part of what happened in that early part of my career was that I was faced again and again with situations that were confronting to my own integrity. And so I had to make a decision, I felt, about if I'm going to pursue this line of work, there's something about myself and my soul that I'm going to have to sell off for money or for work, whatever it is. Uh, and this is my own personal experience, so I'm not painting the whole industry with this brush. I'm just saying this for my personal journey. And I decided I wasn't, I just didn't have it in me to do that. I actually had a teacher once who told the class, you know, only do this work if you have to. <laughs> now, my interpretation of that at the time was I have to do that because I really believe it was the only thing I was good at. It was the only value I had was in this role of performer. Mm. And so I said, well, I have to do it because there's nothing else I can do. Well, that's not what he meant. What he meant was do it because it's your passion, it's your love, it's one of the things that you can't live without. It's the thing that's driving you to be who you are. But I had a very different, it was almost like a box that I put myself in that I felt trapped in. So at any rate, I didn't know how to be anything else but that. And so I had this identity crisis, if you will, at 20 mm -hmm. years old. And one of the ways in which I dealt with that was I started with some friends, um, a, a partner who said, hey, come be part of this organization where we're going to create our own work. So right away, there you are, there's an entrepreneurial piece, which I didn't even recognize at the time is that such, but I was like, I just knew that I didn't want to beg anybody, that was my word, beg anybody else for work. So I'm going to create my own thing. So 20 years old, 21 years old, here I am starting a production company with a couple of friends in New York, multimedia production company. We did um, theater, small theater pieces. We did theater and film festivals, uh, which were very popular and very successful um, in their own scope. And we also, that company did uh, TV, we did industrials, we did music videos, and we did a web series. And so I was very active in that organization for a long time. And... Um, and was, you know, sort of thought maybe that was going to be my career as a producer director type in that role. And then I met my husband, Peter, along the line, along the journey here. And he was also an actor. And uh, we decided that we wanted to become, we had to have a family. And that drive kicked in very hard for me. <laughs> as soon as we got married, I was like, babies, I don't know where that came <laughs> from. But man, that just, I was just really motivated about yes, it. Yes, it happened. <laughs> And I was young. I was 23. Wow. And so uh, it came, came to pass that we had some infertility challenges. And then we'd always said that we wanted to adopt as well as have biological children. And we spent about five years in the infertility cycle, wow. cycles. For those of you out there who have been through that, it's extremely draining, mm. financially draining, emotionally draining. It's very difficult on the relationship. It's very painful, physically painful. Uh, and also we have some ridiculous stories about it too that were pretty funny, but uh, it's, the whole thing is just bizarre. And I won't go into the whole story about how we got to the adoption place, but suffice it to say for that moment when we, when we finally got to the place we were ready to adopt, uh, we were able to welcome a beautiful bouncing baby boy uh, through an agency. We were connected with uh, his birth mother. Shout out to Nicole. She is like my I always call her my little sister. She's not little anymore. She's in her 30s, but she was young at the time. She was 16. Mm. And we got to be in the room when he was born mm. and um, and with her whole family. And it was just, a, it's in, it continues to be a beautiful, beautiful relationship. Mm. He actually was uh, the ring bearer at her wedding last October. And so he was 16 when he was the ring bearer. She was 16 when he was born. It was like this very cool for a full circle moment. And uh, he's also very tall. So he's like, the pictures are funny because he towers over her. She's tiny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's that piece of the story. And then from there, uh, we 
decided to expand the family, and we uh, became foster parents and welcomed Javon and Savon into our family. They were 13 months old. They were uh, had a failure to thrive diagnosis. They were, they were very small. They were 13 and 17 pounds at 13, 13 months old. They were not um, babbling or making eye contact or even able to sit up. One of them was because kind of the commando crawl, but not really. Uh, one of them was not even keeping food down. Horrific asthma and eczema on one of them that we were 24-hour care for that. And slowly they began to come out of their crisis, physical crisis mode, and, and emerge these incredible, brilliant little souls. And... So we fostered them and, and got into the process to adopt them. And about a year into that process, right after they became freed uh, to be adopted, my husband Peter was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And so that was a blow <laughs> for sure. And for a while, we weren't really sure what the outcome was going to be. He looked like he might be an outlier. He looked like uh, it might have a different turn. We had very, very uh, kind of roller coaster experience there all the while being in this foster care situation trying to adopt so having a lot of people a lot of eyes on us and also the family that I was his family is a fairly well-known family in the area where we lived and um, and so there was just a, a lot of community support which was awesome but it was also a lot of public facing stuff mm -hmm. uh, where we were just known in a lot of places and it became very tricky to be authentic, I'll say that. Uh, hence that performance piece came in. <laughs> so fast forward a year into his treatment and uh, actually about 13 months into his treatment and we're just about ready to adopt the children. We have an adoption date and he passes away <laughs> April 15th of 2012. And the night he died... Uh, I was sitting on the cold linoleum floor of my sister-in-law's house where he had collapsed for the last time earlier that day. And I was sitting on the floor there, and I had my phone in my hand, and it was 2 in the morning, and I had just gotten an email from the good people at Units. For those people who are not in New York, that's the organization that does all the organ donations. So I was talking about how he was going to give his eyes to somebody who needed them. Hmm. And I can't remember all the parts, but there was uh, he was still giving, mm -hmm. you know, even after his physical uh, journey had ended. And I got an email from a colleague who was an energy worker that was helping him through his last year, year and a half of, or so. And she had the last words that he ever wrote, which were particularly significant because he lost the ability to communicate mostly the last several weeks of his life. So for an actor, a poet, a singer, a teacher, that's I think that's when he decided really it wasn't going to work anymore for him. Because mm -hmm. if he can't communicate, then he didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. And so the email talked about all the things that he wanted for me and for the kids and what he wanted to the world to know and you know, how grateful he was for his time. He was 40 years old, how grateful he was for his time on earth mm -hmm. um, and for the time that we had together. And the last words of the email were, choose well, choose wisely, choose love. And... When I tell that story, most people hear the words, well, wisely, and love. Hmm. And they think, uh, what a beautiful message. And I heard the word choose. It was the moment at which I finally understood what consciousness hmm. was, was what, what that really means. And essentially being at a position of choice in one's life. To shift from the seat of being at the mercy or the whim of what life brings you and into the seat of I get to co-create, I get to choose, I get to decide what my life looks like. Mm. And that doesn't mean we get to decide everything that comes our way, but it does mean that we get to decide how we're going to show up, how we're going to respond, and we're going to decide what our journey, how we're going to craft our journey, our time here. So... When I'm looking at entrepreneurs and working with entrepreneurs, that's one of the brilliant things about that for me is that I get to work with people every day who are consciously choosing to create and achieve and exceed their own dreams and expectations and also create an incredible impact on the world around them. You have me emotionally distraught right now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, distraught? I, I don't want you to be distraught. No, no, no. I'm not. <laughs> just, just lack of a better, better word, uh, I guess. But uh, yeah, I, you know, if, if that didn't... Uh, 
if, if, if you didn't feel anything on the other side of this, then uh, I, don't, I don't know what you're listening to. <laughs> but you're not listening to the Michael Esposito Show here with Merit. Um, that is, it's, it's quite a journey. Um, I, I know the first time you told it to me, it was emotional for me to hear, uh, to listen to. Uh, I know when I was reading it, same thing. Uh, and then just listening to it again, I was like, keep it together, Michael. <laughs> keep it together. But uh, I, I, I just... It's such an important story to share because of everything I said, teeing it up, right? Mm-hmm. Which is, as as new entrepreneurs, as new people in the business world, we look at these titans of industry that I speak of, right? Mm-hmm. We look at these um, people that we look up to, these mentors of ours, and we think they've had it easy. <laughs> and yeah. um and you know maybe things were handed to them or they didn't experience the the troubles that i've experienced and uh you know knowing you and from meeting you and hearing about you and seeing you in public without knowing you yet um you know i wouldn't have ever thought i'd be like merit knew from the day she came out of the womb <laughs> no, right no, right she that did she's going to be a coach <laughs> and she's going to help entrepreneurs and uh, and be successful at it right cuz you are and then to hear that story of what you had to go through to get to where you are um i think is so impactful to everybody that's listening is that well and to be clear it's just it, there is no arriving right which is what I love about the work that I do. We can arrive in a moment. We can set a goal and achieve a goal and enjoy that goal, hopefully. <laughs> um, I'm like, the, the one time I don't bring tissues in the studio. <laughs> you should thing, know better by now. Don't talk about me. Good thing I know Merit really well. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you need a... I can no, I'm, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> um, but the the beauty of this, the work that we do is that there is no, unless you want there to be an arrival and then you want to move on to something else. And, that, and that's up to you as well. But what I love about it, there's always another layer. There's always another level that we can achieve, right, in the, in the game. There's always something else we can learn. This never stops. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to stop. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I like that, too, that y- y- we talk about that, too, is like, and then what, right? Mm-hmm. It's like... Yeah, what next? That's right, like, yeah. what's next, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple things in your story that I did want to acknowledge because I thought they were important and I was really... I, I, I shouldn't be surprised by you, but I, I was surprised, <laughs> you know, because it's something that people don't talk about. Um, you brought up infertility mm-hmm. and it's something that isn't spoken about. And I'm so happy that you did, not that we have to go down that road. Um, but I think it's really important that you do, that it is spoken about, right? Yeah. Because so many women and men experience it yeah but it's like this hidden thing and like you said that you couldn't be authentic and not in that moment but i'm just saying just in general people they feel like they can't speak about it Mm -hmm. and i think it's really important to speak about i'm i'm fortunate that when devin and i planned to have a kid we had a kid right but without knowing others around us who experience infertility Mm -hmm. we would never know that that exists yeah right and then i think you and i talked about this yesterday in our group was about being politically correct or sensitive to others. Mm -hmm. You don't know what somebody else is experiencing. So therefore you're not as sensitive to others if you don't know about it. Right. Right. So that's why I wanted to just touch on that real quick is that I think it's really important um, that we, we acknowledge that, you know, that it's, it's a topic that people um, experience and, and need to be sensitive to and understand. I really appreciate you you highlighting that a little bit. And I do talk, I mean, when I talk about my story and I tell that, you know, when I say adoption or when I say infertility, and I actually just focus more on the adoption than the infertility because we had already decided to adopt. And so it wasn't like it was an alternative or a plan B. Right. It was more that after five years of being in infertility, having this already part of our plan, I actually plan to adopt. I don't know why. Uh, Specifically, but I plan to adopt when I was, I remember being 10 years old and thinking, I'm going to adopt someday. Hmm. It could be because um, there is adoption in my family, not my, oh. my inter, not in my immediate family, but I had an aunt, a great aunt who was adopted. And, you know, there's other sort of stories. So maybe I just heard it that way. But for whatever the reason, the moment that I said, I'm ready to stop this five year, very painful process on every front. And get out of my own way. I mean, I, I am not kidding when I tell you that the day I said that to myself was the day I connected with the adoption agency totally in a, in a kismet kind of way. Mm. And 
I asked a question and they said, we have one info session per month. It's tonight. Come. And I was like, I'm free. We're there. And eight months later, eight and a half months later, we had a baby. <laughs> so so what a good, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's a parallel or um, great thing to talk about with business, right? And we were talking about harmony before uh-huh. and going back to your grandfather's story mm-hmm. about the printing press coming uh, into the, the table. The, the desktop uh, publishing. The desktop yeah. publishing, uh-huh. right? Um, and, and that pivot there. It, it so often happens in business, right? That if you do just end that five-year stretch that mm-hmm. you just mentioned, right? And make that decision. You know what? We're going to go this way now. The door is open. The door is open. Right? They do. And you yeah. said kismic. And, and I know sometimes we talk woo-woo type of thing, right? I'm all about the woo. So but, <laughs> and so am I. But I think that there's a truth to it all. Right. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Right. The the, the Chinese proverb the proverb of when when the the student is ready, the teachers will appear. 100%. I mean that yeah. that goes back hundreds of years. I don't yeah. know if even more than that. Right. Yeah. There's a reason for it. Yep. Because it's real. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely real. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um. So let's talk about it on a business level too. And in, in your experiences of seeing, I know that I'm one of them uh, entrepreneurs that you've worked with, where you say, get out of your own way, mm-hmm. make a decision, and when they do. The door is open, right? Yeah, it's incredible. And really, so we brought up ego before too. Ego is so tricky because ego ego develops out of protection, Mm. right? Out of wanting to self-preserve. And it's really important. It's really important to to have that element. We can't say, you know, get out of, just release the ego altogether. But we have to be able to manage our ego in a way that is useful and supportive to us. So when we say, well, just... It's not as simple as all of a sudden one day I said, get out of my own way. It was really, I had to, had a, I had enough. <laughs> I had to be in my own way enough to right. finally get to the moment where I was like, okay, I've, I've, I'm now had a, I've hit my boundary. Mm. So it wasn't like, oh, well, I'll just try to do this thing because I'm so magical and wonderful and think that I can, you know, it, that wasn't the way it was. It was like, I am, I've had enough pain, right? And I need this to change. And that's when I, my ego was kicked to the side because mm. uh, I recognized that it wasn't working anymore, you know. Um, and some people never get to that point, and that's, their, that's the downfall, which is hopefully what the work that I do with my clients, hopefully we never get to that point. However, we can, we can head that off before we get to the point where our ego has taken over. Mm. And I, I like that you bring up time because it, it isn't – I think in the story, right, in in somebody's book or bio or whatever, it is just in that moment, right? In that moment, that was that shift. But it does take time. There is there is a, a certain amount of time uh, until that shift really happens, mm-hmm. and and it takes a long time there. I wanted to ask you about fostering um, and how you got involved in that um, and the difference between that and adoption, because I, I had some questions there. Sure. So the uh, my initial process with Peter and adopting Elijah. As I mentioned earlier, we we went through an agency. We were living in California, and the rules are very different here in New York where we live now. Uh, And this has all changed a lot. This is My oldest is 17 now. We're talking about colleges. It's kind of a big deal. And you're still 39. Oh, bless you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, At any rate, um, and so at the time in California, that was a process that we went through through a private agency. And and, uh, we had to be foster parents technically for six months. But we did take him home from the hospital with a permission. I mean, you know, she signed her off her permission and said, yes, this is what I want. I think she had 30, 30 days to change her mind. Um, we were very blessed that we had a beautiful, beautiful connection with her. And she's like, nope. She was very clear. One of the, I mean, honestly, one of the strongest souls I've ever known in my life was this young woman at 16 years old. So clear on what she believed to be right. So we didn't worry about that uh, too much. And then so six months in, that's when the state of California says, okay, this foster pl- placement is – solid and you can go ahead and adopt so then we did that about six months and a couple weeks after mm. he was born so our social worker at the time said that was probably the smoothest adoption she had ever seen and i was still kind of wreck about it because i was so like you know had five years of trauma around infertility so i gotta have this baby uh and also we were just incredibly blessed so we came to, to new york and the situation was very different at the time from new york and i can't speak to too much about how it is now because I, I don't i'm not in it so much anymore but at the time, that same process that we went through in California was about four times the expense and took twice as long. And we just didn't think that it was right on us uh, to 
to go through to put all those resources into that kind of experience when we were um, my husband was a teacher and I was doing a lot of facilitation and leadership development work around diversity, equity, inclusion. And we had some great resources and some great connections in the Western New York area where we lived, where we actually worked with the community leaders who were you know, leading communities of color and um, invested heavily into a diverse populations. And so one of the colleagues at the time was running the the Western New York branch of an agency uh, through which we adopted our little guys. And so we went to her and we said, because in New York, those agencies partner with the county and the state because there are more cases of foster care than the state can handle and the counties can handle. So they partner with private agencies and nonprofits for them to handle kids to case manage. And so I went to her and I said, hey, I trust you. You know, uh, I know what I don't, I, I, I know a little bit about what I don't know, and mm-hmm. I'm willing to learn more, um, recognizing that we are white parents um, and we will need to be really compassionate, understanding, patient about what we don't know and listen more than we talk. Uh, and also having just an incredible amount of com- community support based on the environments and the industries that we were in. So we went to her and she said, great, let's get you trained up. And so we went through a foster care training program, which is, by the way, freaking brutal. Foster care is not for the faint of heart. For, so just know that if anybody wants to go through it, you have to be completely all in. Mm. Um, and it's a tr- very, very tricky system to navigate. And totally worth it, 100%, 110% worth it, 1,000% worth it. Uh, and so we were pla- It took a while for us to get a placement uh, for various reasons. We were very clear that we wanted to adopt. We didn't, um, because we had a young son and because we were living actually at a boarding school at the time, we knew we couldn't have just a revolving door of kids. It wasn't, that wasn't a great environment for that. So we wanted to get into a situation that we thought would be fairly uh, certain that we'd be leading towards adoption. And so it took a while for us to find the right placement and the right kids and us be the right match for them. And it was it was tricky. It was really difficult. Mm. What, what was supposed to be, quote, and kind of easier, end quote, placement ended up not being at all. Mm. And then added that layer of Peter getting sick. So that extended the the scrutiny and the and the challenge and, you know, the county asking a lot of questions like if he dies – are you going to be able to handle on your own? Like, I don't I don't know. I mean, <laughs> and the kids had special needs. And uh, so a lot of people questioning me, saying, you know, why do you want to do this? And are you finding out when they had special needs, finding out, like, are you sure that they want these kids? And I'm like, I. it's, it's a, fair, a fair question, you know. Are you capable? Are you competent? Are you willing and able and and ready to take on what it means to, to parent kids who have these kinds of challenges? And being reactive and not terribly conscious, I was like, I, there was a lot of expletives that I threw around in my head at these sure. people. Because <laughs> I was sure. like, these are my babies, you know, don't tell me what to do, basically. Uh, and I, I, I assume that a lot of those questions that were asked of you were asked that you asked Tom when you met him. <laughs> oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So Tom is my, my husband now. Yeah. And uh, yes. And w- but actually, interestingly <laughs> enough. Um, poor Tom. <laughs> now you say poor Tom, <laughs> but so uh, you sound like my mother. Uh, uh, <laughs> Are you ready to take on this family, Tom? <laughs> yeah, no, but that's actually the brilliant thing that bring, brought us together is that he actually. So I'll, I tell this story because I love the moment I knew that he and I were the right match. We were going, we met on online, and we were you know going back and forth, and he has his own story which I won't disclose because I don't have permission to do that publicly. But he has an own, his own story of, of co- overcoming a lot of obstacles. And so he, I said, so what do you think about, you know, dating or hanging out with a woman who has, who's a widow at 35 or 36 or that seven, I think I was when we met and has three kids, three adopted kids, with special needs. And we're a multiracial, multi-ethnic family. And I had two dogs <laughs> and a house that was being re- revitalized. It was a 200 year old house. And I'm an actor. <laughs> and and, and, yeah, and I'm, by the way, I'm a recovering actor. Uh, and that's a whole nother set of psychosis. So, uh, and he says to me, well, I've done the spiritual and emotional math on that, and I think I'm all in. <laughs> and I was like, spiritual and emotional math. All right. You're speaking my language. Yeah. And so from that moment, 
it's not to say that it's been easy or smooth sure. all the time because it certainly has not. And we've done a ton of work and we're still doing the work. It, it just became super clear at that moment that, that we were at the right moment for right. each other. So he came in and um, and the, the story that we tell is that he wasn't sure. We had been dating a couple weeks and we were already like, you know, very, very serious. It was clear that it was, it was we were serious. And he's like, maybe I should come meet the kids. And I was like, I'm not sure because, you know, it's still early. And what if that doesn't go well? And he said, well, how about if I bring a pizza? And I'll come to the door as the pizza man. And then, and they were little at the time. So, and you can uh, decide based on their reaction, you know, if it's a good idea to invite me in the house or not at that moment. And so he did. He brought a couple of pizzas over. And I said, oh, the pizza man is here. Oh, look, it's my friend Tom, the pizza man. And Jay, who was five at the time, looked up to him and said, hi, I'm Jay. And he held his hand and he said, do you want to see my favorite room in the house? And Tom looked at me with kind of for permission. I said, yeah, sure. And he took him down to the laundry room because hmm. <laughs> that was his favorite room in the house. Right. <laughs> and he was in, in like Flynn. His name is Tom Flynn, in like Flynn at that moment. So That's so funny. I know. Thought you weren't going to make me tear up again. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that's, that's a fun story. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I think about this. Um, so obviously, these great stories that you share, uh, they again go back to the entrepreneurial journey. I believe of grit, right? Determination, mm-hmm. per- persistence. All of those words come to mind. Stubbornness. Maybe. Stubbornness. <laughs> um, I also think about when you said um, something that you're passionate about. And so the work that you do, you're very passionate about, Mm -hmm. but you were really passionate about this family that you were going to create. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think when we think about our business leaders and our entrepreneurs, it's, it's important. So we, we, I I love this because we talked about harmony. We talked about work-life balance and that's you. Like, (laughs) like you, you have this life, this, this story that you just shared, this very personal story that you just shared and it it just ties into that whole entrepreneurial journey because like for me as I'm listening to it and obviously the the purpose of this podcast is to get into people's stories but also so that we could share something with our audience so I'm listening to it mm-hmm. and I'm going okay where and it's like so simple I'm going well that's me trying to discover who I want to become in the corporate world that's mm-hmm. me quitting my job and opening up my own agency that's me it's it's when when people try to live in those boxes that we were talking about earlier of like this is work and then this is home it's so not true because right. everything we do at home and everything we do at work can come together and can be just like interchanged your whole story that you just shared as emotional and heart-wrenching as it could be and and amazing as it is and has as it's become is an entrepreneurial story too. Yeah, yeah. It's the story of a founder trying to find their existence in the world mm-hmm. and and going through the hardships of like getting a bank loan or getting denied by a bank mm-hmm. or getting fired and then finding somebody else and and that company dying off or you, mm-hmm. there's so many so it's it just all comes back to the whole harmony. Um, I'm so happy that you were able to share that story with us, with everybody, and put me through this little <laughs> little the well, torture chamber here for Michael. <laughs> I, I would add the word purpose. Mm. And when the the drive to, for whatever reason, and I'm not even sure I'm so clear on it, but whatever reason, I had an incredible passion and drive and purpose, feeling a purpose around having a family. And I want to differentiate that between, you know, people often say things to me, which I just really strongly dislike. Mm. I won't use the word hate because I don't like that word. To, uh, I don't want to be associated with it, but I will say that I have a very strong reaction to the word, this word of, oh, you're a saint. Mm. People, people said that to me very, oh, you must be a saint. No, <laughs> I am not a saint. What I am is incredibly driven to protect and build and love my family. That's what I am. Mm. And my family, as I define it, as we define it, is me. Uh, obviously, it's my family. Me with connected to my late husband, Peter. Uh, and I learned a ton about what family means through that family that I married into. I mean, gosh, what a, an amazing, incredible group of people. And, you know, we're all, we all have flaws and we all certainly um, – showed each other our flaws in that process of losing him and have since just come together with, especially with his parents. Like we have a whole new sense of family together. You know, they now call Tom their son. Mm. 
and they're definitely grandma and grandma, grandpa to my kids. Like, there's no question about that. They are, they, you know, we have, they call me their daughter still, you know, 10 mm-hmm. years later after their son has passed. We're still very much connected. Mm-hmm. And I learned a ton about family and what that means through through them and, and what they taught me. So that's the, its purpose. You know, it's this, this <laughs> I was going to say ridiculous, but it's, it's you know, I, I would say it's not logical uh, dogged determination to to evolve that and explore it and define it and redefine it and redefine it and redefine it for myself. And I'm not, I can't really tell you where that comes from directly, but I can tell you that I've always had it mm. to have that sense of family. And so when one has a purpose, just like you have a purpose around how what you want to do for your family and for not just your family with Devin and the girls, but your family with Denton and Michael Esposito, Inc., and the work you do in Haiti, and you, right, you, you talk about that mm. as being part of your expression of your family. When, when we have that kind of purpose – you know, you move mountains to make it happen. Right. Yeah. It, it, it certainly makes the hard days easier when you know your purpose. Yeah, that's right. for sure. Um, I, I, I want to ask you about the boardroom when you were a little girl. Yeah. We don't need to go into too much detail, but do you have any quick funny stories about running around the boardroom as a little girl or, or something that you bring back to today? I think, well, speaking to earlier, what we were talking about, you know, having those two personalities. My grandfather, when I, I was... I'm really amused to learn when I was maybe 11 or 12 that my grandfather was known for being, um, what's the polite word to say this? <laughs> Strict. S- strong-willed. <laughs> Stern. And, uh, and um, <laughs> extremely expressive in the boardroom. Mm. He was known for that, um, for his strong language. Ah, I think we're painting that picture now. Mm-hmm. In the boardroom. To me, granddaddy, and I called him granddaddy, like he was, I, cr- you know, crawled up on his lap and he, mm-hmm. I was his, I was the youngest. Right. And there's only three of us, so uh, three grandkids. And so we were very close and I would, I have this wonderful image that I play over and over again when I think about my grandparents, like I'm running down before we had to, you know, safety checks at the airport like this, being a little girl and meeting them in the airport when we're going on a family trip and running down the the, co- the corridor and jumping into his arms right. and he'd pick me up and spin me around, like, that's my granddaddy. Right. And then when I saw him in the boardroom, like as a CEO, he was like pounding on the desk and swearing, I'm not going to have it this way. I was like, what? You know, uh, so that was a really interesting bit of learning for me to see how the different personality traits come out in people. Yeah. And then along those lines, one of my favorite stories about him was, I think he must have been 70. And there was a moment at which the board was questioning his efficacy in his company and that right the company holds his name and that's part of the board's job is to make sure that the company doesn't go off the rails right even if it, at the expense of the founder we went on a family trip to Hawaii uh, and I want to say he may be 70 or 75 and we went parasailing my grandfather went parasailing and he took a picture of himself or they you know they did one of the like tourist pictures of him parasailing and he sent a postcard to each one of the board members saying wish you were here <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of like this I'll show you who's not effective right who's not you know who's not fully in, in uh, control of his, his right. faculties so it was a pretty I cool that. yeah and uh, you also mentioned some stories about how your father as a entrepreneur mm-hmm. also named his business after you he did yeah my my parents named <laughs> talking about having an ego complex my, I was the only child of, of that relationship, and the, the company was called Merit Associates. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and I only ask this because, you know, obviously I named Den 10 after the girls, mm-hmm. and they get to come here sometimes, even though I don't work at iHeart. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they get to come to the studio here and see me work. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes Denise almost was in studio with us today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they see me work at home, and they, they see the different things I do, and they're on camera with me a lot of times sometimes when I'm doing some vlogging or and or watching me during a speech contest like I did last night or things like that. So yeah. they're, they're a part of that. And I've met and, them online and you times. And you've met them. Mm-hmm. They've come to different – yeah, mm-hmm. they, they've – introduce themselves to you on camera, which is also part of this whole cool virtual world we're in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question I have for you is is about that impact uh, on you at, at that young age and just, you know, prepare me for, for what I'm <laughs> in for in the future. You know, I think it was pretty magical, actually. And mm. my parents did a 
one thing they did a good job of with me is making sure that I had my feet on the ground. And I think mm. that was that came from my parents and my, uh, you know, my both had mis- Midwestern roots. My father grew up and born and raised in Indiana. My grandparents were um, from, my grandfather was from the Midwest and my grandmother, you know, they both had, all had very humble beginnings. So you mentioned earlier about having successful people having it handed to them. Like m- these people did not. Mm. Um, there are pr- some pretty, pretty, uh, heart-wrenching stories Mm -hmm. uh, that came from their upbringing. So there was always this sense of like, keep your feet on the ground, kid. Like don't, Mm -hmm. we can go, I mean, my husband asked me the day, what's the most luxurious thing you've ever done? And I said, probably staying in the presidential suite at the Waldorf when I was a kid. Wow. And uh, and that was because of my grandfather. We were there for a trade show in New York and or some board thing. I don't know what it was, but you know, some ridiculous thing. And it's like, Ridiculous meaning I was in the presidential suite at the Waldorf. Like, who right. gets to do that, right? right? And I was like, oh, it's just part of my life. And also it was like, you know, know that you're not, this is not, not everybody gets to do this. Right. You know, you you have, there's a sense of um, responsibility that comes with this privilege. And this this position that you're in, it's about something that was very early instilled that in mm-hmm. me. Um, so you you need to use this, your, your advantage and to the advantage of as many people as you can help, right? Mm. Uh, so there, there was that. And also having, you know, Merit Associates, uh, it, it, there was a sense of pride that I had. I mean, I would ride my bike down, you know, Ocean Avenue and Carmel and know that I was Mike and Connie's kid. And everybody knows Mike and Connie's kid. And my godparents also had a shop down the street. So my, I got to be in my godmother's shop. And it, it was a very, very strong sense of community. Mm. And that was really, really important to me. It still is important to me. I live now in New Paltz. And, you know, COVID has been, I think that's, been pretty easy on me, frankly. My business has thrived and my family has thrived through COVID, which is extremely fortunate. The one place that I think that has been difficult on me was that that sense of community. I, I has not totally lost, but a lot of things have happened. We've, we've lost some assets in our community. You and I know that mm-hmm. very, very personally. Uh, that is, that's been hard is to not have that sense. So I guess um, what to, I, to temper it, I guess, with, yeah. what, you, what you do with, you know, yes, we're very fortunate. Yes, follow your dreams. Yes, you can have anything you want in life. Absolutely, go for it. And then some. And also, bring people up with you. Mm. Always yeah. looking at who else you can help, who else you can serve. Where's the opportunity for the next person? Right. Because it's you, my best friend Jenny talks about the Maya Angelou quote, you're, you're paid for. And that is, the people who came before you paid for you mm. in blood, sweat, and tears and money for you to have what you have, even if it wasn't money. Right. Somehow they evolved the process, the human species enough up to where you could take that ball and run with it to the next step. You have to do the same thing. Maya, An- Maya, Maya Angelou has such so many great quotes, oh right? She's so great. I mean, yeah. I love her quote, especially as a public speaker. I love her quote about it's not it's not what you say, but how you make people feel. That's right. That's one of my my favorite ones that I always. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's energy kinda, leadership, by uh, the way, right uh, there. I love that one, right? Yeah, it yeah. is. It is. You definitely made us feel today. That, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, just just on on your childhood, what I heard in, in everything that you just shared there, and and the person that you are today is a lot of self awareness that from a very yeah. early on. Very early age self awareness. Yeah, that was a gift that my mother, I think, really gave to me because I mean, you know, we sort of joke about the self help industry in the eighties and nineties, and you know, I, God rest his soul, Wayne Dyer, who I just so love. But she had every single Wayne Dyer book. Yes. She had every. Like, I'm okay. You're okay. Like all the things, right? Um, Pathways, I think, was another one. The, our shelves were full of those things. We used to watch Wayne Dyer specials on PBS when right. I was a kid, and that was one of the things that she really. I'm not sure she taught it. To me directly in terms of you need to know this, but um, it was very, very important to her that she had that self-awareness. And so I think I just, I stepped into that role. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up Dr. Wayne Dyer and uh, I, I didn't watch him growing up or anything like that, but I, I was introduced to him a couple of years ago. And uh, it, it's interesting. All these people, they, they bring up um, uh, 
they, they teach us different things and they help us accept certain things. And so for me, when I would have thought about the business world back then, I would never think to bring my kids into it. Mm -hmm. I would never bring and think about, you know, naming it a company after them or being, having them as involved as they are involved in, in the company. But I do remember, um, there was one that I would listen to on repeat and he ends the special with, uh, having his daughter, Gracie sing amazing grace. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm going to bring her on stage. She's got a wonderful voice and he introduces her and she sings amazing grace and it's beautiful. Right. And I think it was that moment that I was like, oh, I want to bring my daughters in because yeah. like, how cool is that? She's sitting fr front row watching her father give a speech. Now, in the moment, she's probably like in the Waldorf at the president suite, like, whoa, what, what, is, what, what does it matter that I'm in the front row? But right. it means something. Yeah. And looking back, it means something. And then him bringing her in and having her close out this this amazing uh, dialogue that he just had with this audience I, was so cool. And, and obviously, it was an impact on me because I think that that's what helped me or allowed me to, to bring my daughters into the business. And, and I hope that they, they can see it the same way that you see it. Um, well, I think that also speaks to legacy, right? I mean, when we're looking at the work that we do as entrepreneurs, we're not just looking to, hopefully, I'll say this, the people that I work with are not just looking to make the money to do the thing, to build the widget, to have it, right? We're looking to create an impact, a positive change in the world. And if that stops with us, well, that doesn't right. mean much. Right. Right. It's not just about us and the, and the founder. It's about the the story that we're telling for generations. Mm. My grandfather had incredible success and also, you know, not. And all of that story allows me, in part, to build on his his journey, what I learned from him, and help you and help other people, help people who are listening to this, who are people, my other clients, people I speak to is not all for naught just because it didn't end the way he hoped it would. Right. His legacy is his whole story. It's all the pieces. And once we bring our kids in and other community members and mentees and things like that, then they get to be part of that story and then continue it on after us. That's mm -hmm. really what legacy is about. I love that, that you just said that, because it, it is true. We do see that, that it doesn't have to be the namesake that gets carried on through the years, but the stories and everything that comes yeah. out of it. Very similar to our own stories, right? Our own stories, the things that we learn from them. Uh, you know, we're not we're not that person that we were, but we learn something from them. Mm -hmm. um, something that I always like to ask uh, is about a mantra. But we we talked a little bit about your mantra already about choose love, mm -hmm. and and what that means to you. And and I, I love the <laughs> tattoo, um, and and I love the word choice in there about mm -hmm. making choices, and that we're always you, know, we, you talk about this conscious choices, conscious right, and and making choices. So I'm going to I'm going to switch gears on you okay. about your mantra since we talked about it okay. and and it is of course very special but you also mentioned someday in quotation marks on your website someday I told myself I would be one of those people who managed to change the world someday dot dot dot. <laughs> so are you? Silence. Uh, I think I mean I my my gut answer is yes. Yes. I'm working on that still. I'm working on what that means for me still, yes. which, like I said, it's we never arrive. I don't want to ever arrive fully. I want there to always be an arriving. So I am constantly redefining, which is sometimes irritating to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just land already? Uh, I know. And I talk about that with you all the time, too, right? Yeah. Like, But we don't want to land. Well, I want to – what I would like to do is to be able to land – Enough to go, okay. We want to get an altitude level. Exactly. <laughs> cruising I want to check, altitude. Check my oxygen, right? <laughs> I'm going to talk to a pilot. Can we get to that cruising altitude? <laughs> <laughs> For a little while, right? And then, because then that, that lets us to, to ask that question, what next, in a way that is from a conscious place and a responsive place and a proactive place rather than a reactive place. And also, yes, I think as the more work that I do with amazing clients like you, the more work that I do on my own with my family, I look at my kids now, and I mean, I'm talking to my son about going to college when uh, six months ago, he, he didn't even think he was a candidate for college. We weren't sure if he was a candidate for college. Now we're looking at it as, oh my gosh, we have all these colleges we can go look at, and he's interested and invested. That in and of itself is kind of a miracle to me. Like his story, I was talking to his college counselor the other day, and I like got teary because I was just like, I'm just so proud of you. And it's not about anything, one thing that he's done. It's that he's already in 17 years lived a life full of overcoming obstacles, cry again, overcoming obstacles that most people never have to deal with. Mm. And he thinks about it. He's like, well, what should I write my college essay on? And he says, 
He's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't really have anything that's happened or anything special. And we're like, are you kidding? Kid? <laughs> like he doesn't, he sees it with such grace and just part of his, just part of who, who he is. Yeah. So, so the reason I go and I go down that road is to say that when we are consciously choosing, or actually even when we're not, we are always having an impact. Mm. We're always having an impact. So we can choose to acknowledge it and take ownership of that and, and lead it, or we can choose to, you know, be reactive and, 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 and negate our responsibilities uh, or hide from it. But we all can have, and we all can have an impact. And I think as I learn more about who I am and what I want to do and my gifts uh, through the work that you and I do together and I work with other clients and my mentors still and my kids and my family, uh, the more I see how that impact can unfold. And so, yes, I think the answer is yes. I think it is. I know it is. Yes. First of all, Merritt. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is, yes, but you know, yeah, through the work that we do together, and uh, from what I see with you, and what I've learned over the years between you and all the different mentors and books and everything that's come into my life is, um, you know, the chain of events of anything that you do, right? You know, you kick a pebble, and you know the butterfly effect, all these different yeah. effects that that, mm -hmm. that are out there that you can speak to. You can name them all these different things, but just to get very simple, is that. Just a little simple things in life of saying hello to somebody, putting mm -hmm. a smile on their face changes their day, changes their, their life maybe, right? Like yeah. you don't know what they're experiencing. Right. And so that goes off and changes the world is that I think it's important for everybody to, to, to know that, that just by greeting somebody with some love, compassion, some empathy, a smile, making them happy, some, as we talk about energy leadership, some mm -hmm. great energy, collaborative energy, just by doing that with one person, you're changing the world mm -hmm. because- um, I know this sounds crazy, but I mean, it's not crazy, but we're all a part of the world. We are that change, right? Yeah, we are, right. we are a person in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you're changing my day, you're changing something in that's the right. world. Yeah. Right. Um, but more specifically to you and the work that you do, I, I see you as changing the world and, and you're like a multiplier of that because. Well, that's lovely. Cause that's what I'd like to be. Yes. <laughs> you, but you, but you are a multiplier of that because like, while I'm trying to change the world through my company which is one piece, and then it has its own arms that expand out. Mm -hmm. You're doing that with me, with this person, with that person. With, so you have all of these multiple people who are part of your group, part of your leadership community that you're training and coaching and helping for them to all go out and change the world. And you're like, you know, just building this huge web, I see, <laughs> of like amazing world changers. And it's just... So cool. Oh, thank so. you. I mean, I, I, I do think that that is ultimately the role that I love to be in is, you know, I have a certain skill set and a certain set, you know, passion and drive and purpose. And there are certainly many, many things that I am not good at. <laughs> so I don't ever purport to be, you know, a, a particular, um, like, I think humility is really important here because, and also confidence, like the difference between confidence and arrogance is that when we are confident in our abilities, we can use them to the best of our ability and also in service of others and the world. Uh, so when we're arrogant, we put ourselves above somebody and then it's usually a reaction to, to feeling below somebody else. So it's not right sized, but confidence is fully owning one's gifts and being able to use them in service and along the lines of our purpose and our, and meaning that's meaningful to us and meaningful to others. So I, I appreciate you acknowledging that. And I, I do see that that's, Something that I really have a lot of passion for and purpose around is is helping other people be multipliers in their own life too. Well, you're doing it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Merit. Thank you. Merit, uh, I usually like to. Well, not not usually, but I think a lot of podcasts always like to say. And here's my last question. But you know what I want to do <laughs> for our audience is you always ask me really good questions that I have to leave our session with and mm. think about and ponder and go to Devin and say, Devin, what do you think about this? <laughs> and then I come back a week <laughs> later to you and I go, I think I have the answer. And then we go into it. Why don't we leave our audience with one of your wonderful questions? Oh my goodness. You might have to pause here for a second. So you can come up with <laughs> this one. is a live show. We're not even taking out the tissue, <laughs> the, the tissue <laughs> sequence. This is, this is live. That's it, it, huh? all, it all makes the cut. Okay. Well. To our entrepreneurs and business leaders, when you turn this recording off, ask yourself. Mm. What do you want to co-create? There you go.
What do you want to co-create? Mm -hmm. So that's your homework, everyone. Merit, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to The Michael Esposito Show. For show notes, video clips, and more episodes, go to michaelespositoinc.com backslash podcast. Thank you again to our sponsor, Den 10 Insurance Services, helping businesses get the right insurance for all their insurance needs. Visit denten.io to get a quote. That's D-E-N-T-E-N dot I-O. And remember, when you buy an insurance policy from Denten, you're giving back on a global scale. This episode was produced by Uncle Mike at the iHeart Studios in Poughkeepsie. Special thanks to Lara Rodrian for the opportunity and my team at Michael Esposito, Inc.